the, the woman who's about to take the stage just moved to the West Coast from Boston. So she's only been in California for a number of days, I think, um, if that. And she's been at EMC for 14 years in numerous roles. Um, and she's got this really interesting mix of tech expertise um, mixed with the executive side of things. So she's got that hands-on experience for both sides. And this is a woman who is an active mentor. Mentorship is something that is so huge with Witty that Carolyn talks about all the time. And she's highly involved with STEM programs as well. And we're going to get her tapped into those in California too. And she likes to talk about um, directing your energy to the things that you're passionate about. Because we're talking a lot about change agents, social change here. And we get all this inspiration from Witty when we're here at the summit. And make sure you take that energy and you apply those lessons to the things you care about. Those are some words that... I have heard myself from Heather Healy. So bring your hands together, warm round of applause. Heather Healy, VP of Service Tech at EMC. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful uh, round of applause. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Uh, whether this is your first witty conference in attending or your fifth, as it is mine, or your tenth, I'm sure you're having uh, an amazing experience and uh, connecting with wonderful women within the industry and also within your own companies, reconnecting with people that you may not have seen um, recently, people that you've uh, interacted with during your careers or at past conferences. Uh, but the most important thing that I think that we're doing in these days together is learning and sharing. Women learn through stories, and there's been amazing stories that have been shared both through the uh, Witty of Hall of Fame event last night and all of the sessions that we've been, uh, we've been attending. And it's really through Carolyn's vision for this entire organization and for the, this event uh, and creating forums like this for us. Uh, we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to you, Carolyn. Thank you so much for, for creating these wonderful opportunities for us. Thank you. I'm going to start with a homework assignment for you all, though, because it's very, very, very important for you to say thank you to those in your organization that have supported Witty and that have supported you coming to attend this conference. So my homework assignment to you today is this week, before Friday night at 5 o'clock when you turn off your laptop because work-life balance is important, um, to make sure that you find out who in your organization was really the, the, the prime sponsor to drive you to um, come to this conference and either email them, pick up the telephone, stop by, say thank you, and let them know the impact that this conference has had on you and what you plan on doing, that, doing with that in, within your or organizations. I think that's hugely important. It's important to the vitality of this organization going forward, uh, but it's also very important in terms of your own visibility within, within your company. So please, please take that seriously and, and do that. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, empowering social change agents. And um, one of the things that um, I want to um, share with you is, having been to a number of these conferences, um, I love the energy that I feel when I'm here. Um, I love the energy and in the, in, in the interaction with, uh, with all the, the, the women and the few men that are in, in, the, uh, in the events as well. Um, but you know, reconnecting with that energy throughout the year in between conferences is something that's very important as well. And one of the things that, um, that I try to do is take some of the lessons that I've learned in listening to you in the audience and, and the other speakers and apply that to areas that I'm most passionate about. Um, and so when I was asked to speak um, at the conference this year um, about uh, social change agents, you know, I, th I thought that was very uh, impactful for me because it's an area that uh, I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm, as, uh, as was articulated in my intro, I've just recently moved to California. Um, and so a lot of the uh, um, experiences that I've had back in Massachusetts around uh, getting involved in my community, um, supporting STEM initiatives, I hope to apply those um, efforts and energy to the West Coast now. So I'm very interested in learning more about those community-based opportunities uh, now that I'm here in uh, both in Southern California as well as in, in the Bay Area here. So if, if you have some, some, some organization that I should be speaking with, uh, about how I might be able to plug in there, please do let me know because I'm, I'm all ears. So, um, you know, reconnecting with the energy that, uh, that we've experienced during the, the conferences is very, very important. Um, I'm going to talk um, about a couple different topics. One is big data 
Um, and you've, you're hearing an awful lot about big data within the industry today. Uh, it's a very important topic. We're going to talk about what is it, uh, what it means to you, and then also use some examples of how big data is changing um, social causes. Um, and just to give you some ideas of, of, of how the, the trends in social uh, uh, causes are going to be positively impacted by big data and analytics and the visual, visualization that uh, results from that. And then I also thought that because it's a passion area for, for me, but also STEM started to come up in a lot of the conversations and a lot of the audience questions um, in a number of the sessions uh, yesterday in particular. And so, uh, and, and, and there was a, a, a sense from the audience members that I've been talking with also in one-on-one -on -one conversations in the hallway of where do you get started and how do you, uh, how do you get started within your companies or within your communities. And so I wanted to uh, take a moment to highlight some of the alarming trends in this space, but then also talk about some of the things that we can be doing um, as individuals and within our companies to help to participate in turning the tide in, in this particular area. And then I'm going to turn it over to you, the audience, and I want to understand more about what inspires you. We can all learn from one another. I'd like to understand the, the uh, social causes that are top of mind for you and how you're engaging with, with uh, those social causes in different ways so that we can learn from, from those experience as well. Okay? So that's uh, the plan for, uh, for the day, or the, the session, rather. So big data. What is big data? Um, the, um, the description that's on the slide here is from McKinsey. And um, the, um, I won't read you the, the, the description, um, but in fact, the term big data originated in the 1990s in NASA uh, when, we, uh, when NASA had described challenges of processing and visualizing vast amounts of information. And we can understand by the nature of what NASA does, there's a lot of information there. And so when, when uh, uh, we hear the term big data, that's the, 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 the genesis of, of the terminology. And really what it means today in a business sense is really joining data sets that may have come from different uh, orientations and for different purposes, joining them together, looking for patterns, visualizing um, what change could, could affect longer term. And, and all of that um, is, is very important to businesses in terms of how we're improving products and services. But then we can also think about, well, what would that mean from a social perspective? What types of things could we be analyzing and visualizing that could improve humanitarian efforts, could improve disease control, uh, could improve ecological challenges? And so there, there's a vast amount of, uh, of work that, uh, that is, is underway right now and, and we can envision it in the future. Let's talk about big data and what this means from an um, uh, effect of the scale of data. So the digital universe is a uh, um, white paper that was published by IDC. And um, in this uh, white paper, it, it's articulated that between the years 2009 and 2020, um, information will grow 44 times. Um, and, and that's just amazing, amazing astronomical growth. Um, to put it in context, Eric Schmidt did some analysis, and he had, had determined through his thorough analysis that from the dawn of time till 2003, the amount of information that humans generated. Think of art, think of music, think of books, uh, written books, um, e-books, think of um, videos and, and movies and music and, and the like, uh, would equate to five exabytes of information, which is a good amount of information. Today, we're generating five exabytes of information every two days. So that puts it into perspective in terms of the scale of, of information. So if we look at that over the course of a year, we're actually doubling inf our information um, every two years. So there's this huge expansion of, of information. Now when we think of big data and we think of the ability to join data sets together and look at problems in, in, with, with many different perspectives, uh, we really have an incredibly powerful tool. So, you know, <clears throat> What's changed is how we're able to analyze um, this in information, how we're able, able to store, join, and analyze the information. And we see through the 90s, we had certain tools that would allow us to do this. And then in the 2000 um, era, you know, we had uh, um, tools that would allow us to analyze these things from an uh, end user perspective, kind of more of a self-service perspective. And these are all business tools. But now we start to see in the 2010s and beyond, a lot of this is consumer driven. You know, there are two billion photographs on Facebook every month. 
You know, that's just amazing information and it's all being driven by those of us in the room, whether it be in our business lives or in our personal lives. And so all of this is driving this, this change uh, to, you know, big data, making sure we have the ability to join data sets, but then also the analytics that we provide on top of that are the really the powerful aspects of big data. So what does this mean to you? Well, as individuals, uh, we all have a digital footprint. We all have a digital shadow. A digital footprint of things that we pu push out to the internet, things that we're sharing with our families and our friends through Facebook and through YouTube and things like that. But then there's also information about us that's now in the system as well, whether it be video surveillance of us walking down San Francisco and doing some shopping um, or you know, using an ATM or some um, you know, medical information and things like that. There's a digital shadow for us. Um, and it's important for us to be aware of that. Um, and, uh, and as some of our speakers were saying, make sure our profiles are, are not uh, split across different mediums and, and things like that. Um, but so, you know, this is an important aspect for us to, to consider as, as well. Our digital shadow can be very, very powerful. So if we look at the human face of big data, there's a lot of information out there about us. Um, I encourage you, uh, if you have an, an interest, to go to the EMC um, website or uh, look at uh, some of the um, uh, YouTube videos around the human face of big data, which is a book that we uh, have, um, have uh, sponsored. And it really, what we did is we took uh, smartphones, people with smartphones, and we asked them to volunteer into participating into this. And we collected a lot of information about where they went, what their interests were. We would ask them periodic questions and uh, very innocuous questions to very serious questions and gathered uh, input from all over, the, all over the world and analyzed that. And it's really a, a very, uh, tells a very telling story about our culture in, uh, in this time of, uh, of change. But then there's also the social side of, of, of big data and what are the things that we could be doing with these data sets um, in terms of analysis that would help humanitarian efforts. And so what I wanted to do is take you through some examples of, of these efforts and show you in, in real life uh, what we're doing um, in the world uh, as it relates to uh, solving humanitarian challenges and some of the things that we should all be aware of and that we may be able to apply our talents to for the nonprofits and NGOs that we might be interested in working with. So with that, I'll start with uh, disease. So until very recently, uh, the disease smallpox was a, a, a terrible problem. But through con uh, concerted efforts around the world, we were able to contain smallpox and, and virtually eliminate it, which is fantastic news for the human race. But if we turn our attention now to another horrible disease, and that would be polio. And in a country like uh, Nigeria, um, the new cases of polio that have been reported in 2012 which would be a million new cases per year in 2012, half of which were found in Nigeria, children with polio. That's an amazing statistic, horrible statistic for that country. If we think about that mean, what that means to the child, to the family, to the community, and to the economy of Nigeria, it's just overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. And so, you know, part of the challenge is that many areas in Nigeria remain unmapped. There is no um, mapping of these, these uh, villages or these, uh, these communities. And, uh, and then there's also um, a, a number of political and, and, uh, and religious um, strife issues happening there, which are preventing many of the children from being inoculated. And so we have the cure. We're not able to deliver it to the people that really, really need it. And the result is just devastating to that community. So there's a task force that's been put in place that has included uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, among others, uh, where we're deploying technology, uh, which includes satellite imagery, uh, smartphones, um, and applications to track vaccinations. And through these efforts, um, inoculation workers are fanning out across these unknown villages and tracking their uh, vaccination efforts and inoculation efforts in these polio hotspots. And the organization is using big data and mobile technologies to get rid of polio in these areas. And so we're really encouraged by the, by the uh, rate and pace of inoculations. And you know, soon we'll be able to do analysis on the improvement in terms of the, uh, the, um, reducing the number of new cases of polio in that particular area of the world. So very important work being done in, uh, in, a, in, in this part of the, the world. Um, aren't these guys cute? <laughs> So for the animal lovers out there, um, so chimpanzees 
Um, there's a German group of scientists that uh, are, is combining facial recognition technology that's used in human facial recognition technology and applying it to chimpanzees. And they're mapping, they're able to identify the chimpanzees work, uh, um, operating in their natural environment. They're combining that with audio information as well. And they're learning an, an awful lot about the, the chimpanzee culture that we hadn't known before. And so this is another area where we're taking new technology and uh, big data and combining it for the uh, betterment of, of uh, learning more about these, these uh, furry little critters, uh, which are important to our, our knowledge of evolution. So uh, also another um, area, and I love how we have the identification and the uptime. You know, I think that's uh, it's definitely a, an engineer in there working. <laughs> so, um, so how many of you have used Google Earth or Google Maps to um, map uh, where your, your house is in your neighborhood? OK, pretty much everybody. It's pretty cool, right? Well, you know, I think it's really cool for kids to see that as well. Um, but I want to uh, let you know that, um, you know, it would be pretty unnerving for me if I looked up my address and I didn't see anything on Google Earth or Google Maps. And it would be really unnerving if I did that and I didn't see anything of my community, my, na my neighborhood, my community, my town, uh, maybe even my state. That would be pretty unnerving to me at this point because it's, it's part of my identity. Well, in Rishi Aurobindo, just outside of Calcutta, India, there were three young people who um, found that their community wasn't on Google Maps, wasn't on Google Earth. And, um, and they were pretty perturbed by that. But then they started to talk with their community leaders and they determined that because of this, they were also not on, not because of this, but they also found that they weren't on, on the government's radar screen as well. And so they were missing out on important um, programs such as water uh, purification, vaccinations, and other health, uh, health uh, programs within, uh, within India. So the youngsters became activists, and uh, they began working with uh, local nonprofits um, and looking at uh, uh, information about other communities and, and uh, government programs in the area. And they started to track. Uh, they started talking with the neighborhood and started to track uh, vaccination and inoculation uh, rates and, and disease, and started to track where garbage was collecting in their community and how that was was impacting uh, disease levels as well. And the youngsters have shown that by using big data from other sources and also collecting data from within their own community, that they can uh, build the case to influence change uh, for their community. So just another example of, uh, of you know, um, inspiration, I guess, from, uh, from uh, the youngsters, but also you know, using science and technology to, uh, to improve uh, their communities. So next up, I wanted to talk about Datakind. Um, has anyone heard of Datakind? It's also known as the um, Data Without Borders effort. So Datakind um, is a really a unique uh, organization. What they do is they take data scientists and they pair them with NGOs and nonprofits. Um, and they basically have weekend retreats where the scientists get together and volunteer their time uh, to work with the NGOs and the nonprofits to analyze the information from different sources uh, to provide support to decisions that need to be made um, to improve the, the, uh, the efforts of the NGOs and nonprofits. And we're going to uh, actually play a video right now, uh, which will take you through an event that was held in New York City. Um, and uh, in, in, it highlights a couple of the NGOs and nonprofits that were positively impacted by this, uh, this uh, data diving event, is what, what they call the data diving event. So, with that, could we play the video? Hello and welcome to The Take, I'm Ted Wayman. Well, there's a new breed of data scientists at work, and they don't keep regular office hours. For the dedicated volunteers at Datakind, a great weekend doesn't mean a trip to the beach. More often than not, it involves a two-day marathon of sleuthing, scraping, analyzing, and teasing out valuable insights from complex data sets brought to them by nonprofit groups and NGOs. These are institutions facing giant global challenges with few resources for the kind of data analysis that can help solve their problems. And that's where this band of self-described generous geeks eager to help step in. 
Organizations submit proposals to Datakind with projects ranging from analyzing fertilizer use in Uganda to policing patterns in New York City. Fueled by coffee and commitment, working late into the night with no pay, these data devotees share one goal, to use big data to make a better world. This weekend, we're doing our first ever data dive. We decided to go on this mission and try to build this bridge between the data science community, the nonprofits, NGOs, international organizations, and say, what are your data problems and, and how, could you, how could you use our help? Sometimes fertilizer, even if you know it will increase your yields, does not make sense to invest in against other needs. For example, education of your children, maybe even feeding your children. We were hoping that we could have more brains sort of involved in looking at our data and deciding what kind of practices are happening in the NYPD. Are they in fact discriminatory like we're hearing uh, or are they not? Nonprofits have a great need right now to do analysis of data, and there just aren't a lot of resources at those nonprofits or at those government agencies to do those things. What I'm really optimistic about is that they'll actually be able to help us figure out ways that we can use new tools and technology to get data um, out to the rest of the world faster and easier. Our primary goal is that by the end of the weekend, each one of these organizations has learned something new about the data that they brought here. Data scientists are completely uh, turned on by data. The better, the cleaner, the newer, the fresher the data, the sexier it is. It's sexy if you can actually make a difference. And that's, that's what this data is. It's collected um, by people who want to make a difference for that goal. I'm a data scientist. I'm a graduate student in statistics. I'm a statistician. I'm a data analyst for a hedge fund. I am a database engineer. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm a data scientist at an uh, online dating site. It just happens to be the skills that, that I have and a lot of these other folks have, and we'd like to put them to good use. You're just in doing the analysis -y stuff. There's a lot of data on the, the wiki page. I also have a PDF that explains just what the actual values on the bottom are. Do you guys have a starting point on cleaning and analyzing the data? We need to get an SCT client on your computer, and I actually I realize I have one. Give me, give me two minutes. I'm not going to know what that means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm 100% committed till midnight. That's the that's the minimum cutoff for me. Closer to the end of the night, you feel more excited than you were at the start of the day, and so now we just want to stay here longer. <laughs> We have so much cool stuff. I'm looking forward to today's presentations because there's so much stuff that happened over the course of the last 24 hours that I don't even know about. We tried to do the la latitude longitude conversions in post GIS. The problem really lies in the data provider level. There seemed to be some kind of seasonal trend. The processes to assess it and the right data has been set up. The very significant thing that we're coming away with in terms of the actual work that was done here was a very clean package um, that, that is a, a building block for a lot of the work that we'll do in the future. It's going to make it easier for you know my mother or my next door neighbor to lend to you know a woman so she could buy a sewing machine in Sub-Saharan Africa. Moving forward with the data, I'll feel stronger about uh, the claims that I'm making and the kind of analyses that I'm running on the data. This organization is amazing. I think that that's amazing that through big data, I can connect with people that I'll never meet, I'll never see, and I can make an impact on their lives. It's really exciting like, to be able to do something that we think will actually improve the world. If you can be like a little part of the machinery that like, affects change, then I think that's kind of cool. And I think my generation will have a good, sort of an important role in that. The idea of, of really being able to, to take these raw materials that are the data and, and bring them all the way through the process to where you can explain to someone 
exactly what's happening. I mean, that's the most satisfying thing in the world, to be able to say, like, I took this thing that used to be a mystery, whether it was small or large, and now isn't. That's a profound thing that you've done, and I think that being able to do that is a tremendous contribution to society. Thank you guys so much. It was awesome. So as we can see, big data solves business problems, solves uh, services challenges, but also can be applied to social challenges as well. And so that's something that, uh, you know, it's very inspirational when I see technologists get together like that and apply their skills in, in areas that, uh, you know, it's not just about giving money uh, to your NGOs, and that's important in, in your uh, nonprofits, but it's uh, very important in terms of time and your skills. And so those are uh, inspirational stories uh, um, across, the, across the board. Whether you're a data scientist or not, you can apply your talent. You, you heard many different uh, folks in there that, that uh, they didn't have a specific background in, in, uh, in, as a data scientist, but they're contributing and, uh, and having an impact. So well done to, uh, to, to that organization. So I'm going to switch gears here and, uh, and talk a little bit about STEM. Um, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, a real passion point for me. Um, one of the things I was thinking about uh, actually was, um, you know, who inspired me from a math and science perspective when I was a kid. And I have to say, when I was, uh, when I was in, the, in the fourth or fifth grade, I didn't have a lot of confidence around math. I was constantly going up and asking my math teacher for, you know, confirmation that I was doing this right, because I hated making mistakes. And, uh, and, um, and he was very patient with me, very patient with me. And uh, uh, Mr. Koza, I remember him to this day, uh, very patient with me. And finally, he started to get a little stronger with me, saying, look, you know this. You know this. You don't need to ask for confirmation. You, you know this. And so I started to get more confident. And then on the science side of things, I was interested in science, um, but I guess I didn't, I, I didn't fully, uh, I wasn't fully aware that I was interested in science. And I realized, looking back on it, that my um, fifth grade um, reading and language teacher, uh, we had to do uh, book reports, constantly book reports. And you know, I, I was, I would, you'd be able to pick your own topic. Um, and then she would kind of hand out topics here and there. And I started to realize that she would um, hand out topics, and in particular to me, she would hand me autobiographies um, to, to read about women in science. So Madame Curie. Uh, was, was, was one of them, um, and Ada uh, Lovelace was another one, and, and just learning more about uh, uh, women in, in science, and I look back on it, and I believe it was purposeful um, on her part for an entire year. I pretty much researched, you know, science and mathematicians, and, you know, so it gave me a, a lot of inspiration, and I think back to, the, to those times in terms of that was a gentle push for me to, to uh, support uh, my interest in math and science. But as we look at um, um, the statistics today, uh, if we look at uh, surveys of, of students coming into high school, 28% of high school freshmen will declare interest in STEM-related fields, which equates to about a million students in the US each year, okay? But the challenge is, is that of those students, over 57% of them will lose interest by the time of graduation. So something's happening um, along the way. And we know that logically, um, it probably requires less resources to keep somebody interested in something than to spark an interest in something. So we really need to focus on this. We really need to capture uh, the attention of, of these students and help them to understand and see the possibilities. Because as a country, we really have a, a real challenge from a business perspective and a society perspective if we're not investing in these areas and uh, you know, we have a real risk to innovation and uh, in, in the prosperity um, that we, we could enjoy if we, uh, if we don't have uh, the great minds applying their talents in these uh, particular areas. And then as female students go, um, females express interest in STEM at a far less rate than, men, uh, than male students do. Um, and to emphasize that point, I have a, a graph here that uh, comes from the College Options Org uh, nonprofit. And, um, and as you can see, from an overall math science, uh, I'm sorry, STEM-related uh, uh, um, interests, the numbers are climbing for the, for the boys, but for the girls, they're starting to, to drop off again. And so we've, uh, we've got a real concern here. The gap is widening, uh, and over time, this could uh, represent a, a real challenge for us. If we think back to the Whitty Hall of Fame last night and, and the recognition that we were providing to these wonderful women within the industry, um, something like this is very alarming to us. Where will we be on stage in 30 years' time? Who will we, who will we be recognizing? And so it's a, a real, real um, important uh, aspect for us to consider. So 
EMC, of course, as many of the companies in this room, is very um, concerned about this and is investing a, um, a, a quite a bit into STEM-related programs and, and projects. We do an awful lot of things to bring students into um, our company, uh, to have them shadow us, to have them participate in seminars, to have them participate in innovation um, events, um, and, uh, and really just give them a sense of what it, what it is like in a high-tech company. Um, and so those things are, are, are very, very uh, important. Um, but, you know, some of the uh, examples that I wanted to highlight to you, it's not always a tops-down um, corporate initiative that, uh, that um, is, uh, is the only option. There's also kind of more grassroots uh, opportunities as well. And I love when I hear a new idea from somebody within the company of an area that they want us to invest in. And I'm always uh, keeping my ears open for that uh, so that we can really channel investment to areas of, of passion for folks. But in any case, uh, one area that I wanted to uh, highlight in terms of a program is Girls to Tech. Uh, this is a program in China where we have employees that are mentoring female university um, students and helping them to understand what uh, careers in IT uh, will be like. Um, and, uh, and so that's an important uh, aspect. Um, the second one here is Citizen Schools. You hopefully uh, visited them in the hallway, um, just uh, outside the door here. Um, this is an organization that really works on extending the school day, essentially, by bringing in volunteers to work in the afternoons to help students to um, understand, uh, you know, working on projects and programs and, and, and help them with, uh, with uh, tutoring and providing academic support. Uh, so also another great, uh, another great program. And if you haven't uh, checked, uh, checked out the, uh, the, the uh, table, um, please, uh, please do so. Um, the third one that I wanted to highlight is VEX Robotics. And um, uh, robotics is, actually has a very um, um, you know, fond place in my heart uh, because uh, it's something that I kind of toyed around with when I was a kid. I was, I was um, you know, I was probably the only girl in the computer lab for the first five years of my interest in, 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 uh, in, in computers, and I loved it. Uh, and I had, you know, some great teachers that, you know, would, would bring in, you know, robot kits and whatever, and, and I'd be kind of like, what, what is this? And you just start playing with it. And it was just, it was a toy, but it was a learning experience as well. Well, VEX Robotics is a national competition um, organization that uh, really um, pairs up um, uh, youths and, uh, and corporate uh, organizations and um, you know, we provide uh, support and mentoring um, to help the students in, in their uh, robotics adventures. And in fact, um, at uh, EMC World, which is our annual user conference, where we have about uh, 10 to 12,000 uh, employees and customers and partners together in Las Vegas, um, we had uh, um, a VEX Robotics kind of um, bullpen, if you will, in the middle of the, the floor um, in, in the conference area. And it was probably one of the most popularly attended um, areas. People were just kind of like, it was like a boxing ring with the, you know, the kids uh, in, 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 with the robots that they had, had built. And the employees and customers, whatever, just, it was, it was, they were surrounding it, you know. It was, it was, we should have sold tickets because that would have been, you know, a fantastic revenue opportunity or, or you know, diverted that to the VEX Robotics competition. But anyway, um, you know, a great, uh, another great opportunity um, to, um, to, uh, to get engaged. Um, and then the, the, you know, there's many more that EMC as a company is uh, sponsoring and participates in, but I also wanted to include some things that you and the audience in the conversations that I've had in the past day and a half have talked to me about and given me ideas uh, about. So I share them up here. I, I picked up a couple of the logos. Uh, this is the first robotics uh, um, uh, competition. Girl Scouts has an awful lot of, uh, of uh, programs as well that, uh, that you can engage with. Um, Girls for Change, also another organization that uh, is out in the, in the, uh, the hallway there as well. Um, NC WIT, uh, National Center uh, for Women in Technology, has some amazing programs as well. Um, and, and they also have local chapters. And I know that uh, WITI, obviously, the, the work that we were doing uh, with the uh, AT&T uh, Hackathon and, um, and a number of the other programs that, uh, that we've done in the past, um, you know, get involved with your local Woody chapter and, and, uh, and you will certainly be able to uh, plug into these efforts as, as well. Um, so these are just some, uh, some of the ideas uh, for you to, uh, to think about um, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, spar some, uh, some d direct your energy to some of the areas that you, you feel more passionate about. Um, and with that, what I'd like to do is actually turn this back over to you. Um, and here some of the areas that uh, you're most interested in and areas of social change that we can all learn from you um, about in, in, uh, in our time together. So what inspires you? Can we have a microphone? Over? Great.
Uh, this is perfect because your previous slide didn't include um, Technovation and I was thinking, oh, we've got to get Technovation on there, so this is great. Um, so I'm a, I'm a, a founder of a startup company. Uh, we um, launched last October 2012 and my company is doing well and we stream social media and we're streaming this um, event. So that's one part of my life and I love it. And then the second part of my life and a lot of effort that I do is um, STEM-related activities. So the first one is uh, Technovation Challenge which I've talked to almost everybody about in the room, I think, if not. Um, but if it's something that you know, EMC wants to get involved in, that would be super. So Technovation Challenge um, is focused on high school girls. And what we notice is that um, high school girls may not have anything on them, like not a cent to their name, but the one thing they will have is a cell phone, exactly. And so we took that uh, model and we said, what if we make them producers of a cell phone instead of, instead of just consumer, mm -hmm. right? And so our program is an um, after-school program uh, for 12 weeks starting in January and it finishes in May. And it's a really simple model. After school for two hours on Monday nights, um, you know, a, a professional like you mm -hmm. would, be met, would be matched with four girls or five girls from high school and then over a course of 12 weeks, you would teach them how to make an app on a cell phone using uh, App Inventor from mm -hmm. MIT. And um, you're not just teaching them how to make an app, you're teaching them entrepreneurship, because mm -hmm. you're gonna say, okay, your app, fantastic. How are you gonna sell it? How are you gonna market it? Mm -hmm. what, you, what price point are you gonna put it at? Who's going to buy right. it? Who's your competition? So they really understand from your expertise mm -hmm. um, how to make an app and then sell it. This program has reached 1,900 girls in 13 countries so wow. far, and we've only um, been in, in business for three years. Um, our, our goal is to double that number next year, and then my personal goal, which I think a few people were raising their eyebrows at, was in five years, I want to go to every country in the world. So with your help, um, technovationchallenge.org, you got to help us. Um, you know, we're small, but, but our, our model is so simple and we can replicate really easily. So if you guys are interested, we'd like mm -hmm. you to um, help us like that. That's Thank fantastic. You. Social change agent right there. Thank you for that. That's uh, wonderful, wonderful information. Hi, Betsy Collins, I'm from Colorado. And one thing that inspires me that I think technology can assist with actually is something that's going on on my campus. Um, I work for the University of Colorado, Denver, Anschutz Medical Campus. We like long titles in higher education. Um, <laughs> and one thing that's going on on my campus is we recently opened the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center and we have a leading researcher in obesity research, um, which is kind of interesting because of where we're located. And I consider it a huge food desert where we are located. We're lo located in Aurora, Colorado. And there's really not a lot of fresh food available where I'm at. Now, where I live, which is close to Boulder, Colorado, has one of the best farmer's markets in the world. It has um, tons of local organic farmers that you can join community-supported agriculture with, et cetera, et cetera. But 30 miles away, it's really, really hard to get your hands on fresh organic food. So one thing I'm just throwing out is I think, you know, just this idea of big data is how can we tap into um, sourcing local food, fresh food for those food deserts in our cities that may not know mm -hmm. that what they're missing, basically. Sure. Um, and making that affordable. And I've seen um, on documentaries different ideas to do that. One is like a mobile grocery store um, where you have a truck and it goes to different neighborhoods on different days and sells food at reasonable prices, things like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking through how can I, how can I do something in, in this neighborhood and in this community. Thank you very much, uh, Betsy. That's uh, very inspirational, and I'd like to actually follow up with you uh, and, and uh, have a conversation around what we might be able to, uh, to, uh, to brainstorm and, and do together on that. Great. We're... We're giving the mic runners quite a uh, gymnastics uh, <laughs> exercise. 
Hi, I'm Jen Graybeal, and um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is working with students and, um, and kids in 4-H. And so, um, does everybody here know what 4-H is? Probably not, yes? Awesome. So, um, a lot of times you see 4-H kids at the fair, and they've got their animals with them, right? But 4-H also has a whole program um, related to STEM. And um, it works not only with high school students, but kids as young as five. And um, they can incorporate science, technology, engineering, and mathematics into lots of different kinds of projects that they take on um, sort of under the umbrella of 4-H. And what's great about it is that they can design their own project, they can sort of work with a, with a developed curriculum, and they can do um, sort of be self-led in a lot of ways. One of the things that 4-H um, would really benefit from, um, if you have some time, is guest speakers. You can come in to a project group and um, provide your expertise to them and help to, to guide them. So um, some of the things that they've been able to do, there's a, an app on the App Store. If you guys are interested in getting a little more exercise, making sure that you're eating healthy, there's one called um, Eat and Move Omatic. And this was created by 4-Hers in a project group um, to um, help other youth figure out what it is that they're eating and how that impacts and what their exercise um, impact is on, on that. And here in California, we have a wonderful um, technology leadership team and they, um, they provide all of the IT support for um, big meetings. Like we have a, the State Leaders Conference where we have 400 high school students that all come together and they, um, they run all of the streaming, they run classes, they, run, um, they just did a whole series of how to make videos using your phone and edit them and get them uploaded and they run a uh, competition. So there's lots of opportunities there and um, they're in every single state in the, in the country as well as Puerto Rico. So just call your local county office and they can connect you up with your 4-H program. Great, thank you so much. Other examples that anyone wants to share? I don't see hands, but I have a microphone. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Beth Garriott. Um, I'm here actually really passionate about women in STEM um, and so passionate that I work for an organization called Tech Women. And, uh, and we're here and we're seeking mentors in the Bay Area to participate in our program this fall. We bring women who are leader, emerging leaders in technology and science and engineering from Africa and the Middle East to Silicon Valley and the Bay Area to be mentored by you. Um, so it's actually a really phenomenal, really life-changing experience for both the mentors and the mentees from Africa and the Middle East. Um, and these women go back and do pretty incredible things in their countries and they start companies and organizations. Um, they just really are, are, are social changers and world changers and they're um, able to network with, with women in tech here and really kind of change their lives and their professions um, and, and their perspectives. And so really check it out. Tech Women um, is a pretty, pretty wonderful thing. Great, thank you very much. Well, fantastic. Oh, we have another here. Hi, I'm Elaine Starling, and I wanted to mention an organization called Women Impacting Public Policy. They represent 68 professional women's organizations and over 1 million women-owned businesses across the U.S. It's a nonpartisan organization, and the thing that's so exciting about it is they've identified eight different areas that lead to success in business. If you can't get access to capital, it's really hard to grow your company. Little things like that. Well, they've been able to bring all this collaboration together because women get the need to collaborate. Women are six times more likely to share than men do. We learn from each other and we value that collaboration. Well, as a consequence, the model that they've created, one of collaboration, is being broadcast out throughout the, the world. They're meeting with a number of different organizations worldwide, and I wonder if there isn't an opportunity for us to look at big data in a different way. 
Because we know from all the research, if you want to transform a third world country, educate and empower women. Mm -hmm. We make over 85% of all consumer purchases. We make over 90% of all the healthcare decisions. You want to improve the healthcare system? Talk to us. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. That's great. So I think that we have, um, uh, you know, as I said at the start of the, the talk, WITI uh, is, is a wonderful forum for us to learn from each other, uh, collaborate as, as uh, we've, been, we've been talking about. Um, it really, you know, when you go back to your offices uh, later on this week, um, you know, we'll click back into our normal routines. Um, and uh, at some point you'll be wondering, how am I going to reconnect with the energy that I felt on that Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday? And uh, you've made a lot of connections here. Reconnect with the people that, uh, that uh, you've met here. But also, if there's a way that you can apply the lessons that we've learned here and the energy that you feel here into a social um, cause, then, uh, then that is you know, something personally that I get a, a lot of uh, value and, and, uh, and energy out of that myself. So I wanted to share this uh, with you, plant some ideas, uh, plant some seeds, but also hear from you. And it's just been wonderful to hear the fantastic stories of opportunity. Um, so nobody should be walking out of the room going, where do I start? Because you start all right within the conversations that we've been having here and some of the examples that we've been talking through. So thank you very much.